Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you and we're continuing with the Crusades. Uh, list that uh, Kings and Generals, sorry, Kings and Generals have here. This one is called Battle of the Manzikut. Manzikut, 1071 Byzantine uh, Seljuk Wars documentary. I hope I the pronunciation is okay there. So let's go ahead and get into this. And see what's going on in Ting, you understand? Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. The Battle of Manzikert in 1071 was one of the most significant turning points in medieval history. The Eastern Roman Empire was facing nomadic conquerors, as it had done so many times in the past, but this invasion was different. It caused a cascade of events that made the West and the East, the Christian and the Muslim worlds, clash violently, but in a way that truly connected Europe and Asia for the first time. The initial contact between the Byzantine Empire and Islam did not go in the former's favour. The emperors started losing territories to the Caliphate in the first part of the 7th century, the Umayyads and then the Abbasids were pushing their advantage, and even threatened the capital Constantinople on a few occasions. Fortunately for the successors of Rome, the balance of power changed drastically in the middle of the 9th century. The Abbasid Caliphate was struggling to keep centralized rule over its holdings. The Byzantines used this to strengthen their position and restored their control over the Balkans, Anatolia and northern Syria. In 1045, they conquered the capital of the Armenian Bagratids in modern western Turkey, Ani. Controlling Ani was strategically crucial. On the other hand, losing the traditional buffer zone between the Muslim world and the empire created new problems, and they manifested themselves in the new warlike nomadic force, the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuks were a tribe from Central Asia that adopted Sunni Islam at the beginning of the 11th century. Through a series of wars, they became the masters of this region by the year 1040. Their conquests continued, and in the next 15 years they took control of modern-day Iraq and Iran. The Seljuk Sultanate came into contact with the Fatimid Caliphate and the Byzantine Empire, at the same time, Transcaucasia was vassalized, and that opened a new lane into the Byzantine Empire. Man, you see how long Christianity and Islam has been fighting each other, even before this time. This is 11 something. Why can't people just <laughs> let people live, man, you know? If what you believe is right, then your God's gonna take care of those who didn't believe and same thing for the other side but you see once they once they start fighting for territory and stuff like that 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 then that becomes political and, and not religious i'm sorry so you, people are going to say that uh really religious beliefs is what's driving it and thing like that but after a while well, it's not it's not religion anymore it's politics you know what i'm saying but uh, let's keep going here in 1054, the Seljuks attacked the Byzantines for the first time by raiding Trebizond. The new ambitious Sultan, Alp Aslan, used this weakness in 1064 to capture ever-important Ani. The Empire's defensive strategy relied on a chain of fortresses stretching from the Caucasus to Syria. The fall of Ani opened up territory from Kars to Edessa and shortly after, the fortresses of Malasgert and Alat near Lake Van were conquered, becoming operational bases for future invasions. In 1067, Antiochia, Melitene and Caesarea were raised by the Seljuks. The gates to Anatolia were now wide open. Emperor Constantine of the Ducas dynasty passed away in 1067, his widow Eudokia recognized the dire situation the empire faced and was eager to limit the power of the Docus. So she married a member of a Cappadocian military family, General Romanus Diogenes. The new emperor was anxious to drive the Seljuks away and even planned to take Iran, Iraq and Syria. 
In March of 1068, Romanus amassed a new army and marched towards Caesarea. He received news that near Caesarea had been raised by the Turks and was able to intercept part of their army near Tefrike, where he gained a complete victory. By 1069, the situation started to get out of hand, as a new raiding army attacked Melitene and then Iconium, deep in Byzantine territory. Romanus knew that he had to end the problem and started gathering a large force. At the same time, Alp Arslan was fighting against the Fatimids across the Levant. The Sultan was not sure that he could fight on two fronts, so he sent an emissary to the Byzantines. The Seljuks promised to stop their raiding, but the Sultan was not able to control every vassal tribe, so minor raids continued. Man, I, I love Romanus the storytelling here. recruiting troops and adding new mercenaries to his force. Historical sources diverge wildly from the very modest 40,000 to the fantastic 400,000, but it doesn't seem possible that he could have gathered more than 100,000. 20,000 troops stayed in Constantinople and Thrace, as the Empire was also at war with the Normans of Sicily, making an attack on its It's just war everywhere! Possible. The Byzantine army was truly multinational, as it included Normans, Cumans, Bulgars, Syrians, Armenians and Slavs. Serving in the Byzantine army was both prestigious and profitable, so emperors were able to choose from the best the medieval world had to offer. In February of 1071, Romanus sent an emissary to al Baslan to renew the treaty, and as the latter was besieging Fatimid control of Aleppo, he happily agreed. However, the emperor's plan was more cunning, and he embarked on the campaign against the Seljuks in March, which probably means that his ambassadors were spies, judging the strength of al Baslan's army. The Byzantine Emperor planned to take control of Seljuk fortresses near Van to stop future raids. In July, Romanus reached Theodosiopolis. The Sultan learned that a significant Byzantine force was on the move towards strategic Manzikert and Alat. He abandoned the siege of Aleppo and moved into modern-day Iran, where 10,000 warriors joined his army. This swift movement allowed Alf Arslan to hide from the Byzantine scouts and travel via a route unknown to them. Romanus ignored his general's advice to await reconnaissance on Seljuk forces and moved towards Manzikert. The emperor divided his army and sent 30,000 to defend the passage to the west of Lake Van, as that was the direction from which he expected the Seljuks to counterattack. He was sorely mistaken. Alp Arslan used his army's mobility and advantage in scouting to move around the eastern banks of Van. Trap him. The mountains oh, to the wow. north of the lake helped cover this maneuver, and he was able to attack the secondary Byzantine force from the north. We don't know much about this short battle near Alat, but it seems that the Byzantines were surprised, as they expected the attack from the south and their positions were not suited to defend against an attack from another direction. <laughs> as Seljuk spies were able to spread the news that the Emperor's army was already defeated, the Byzantine force near Alat began its retreat to central Anatolia despite not suffering any losses. Meanwhile, Romanus took Malazgurt on the 23rd of August and began moving towards Alat. The Byzantines still suffered from a lack of reconnaissance, while Alp Arslan was informed about the fall of Malazgurt. On the 24th of August, the Seljuks destroyed a few Byzantine units sent to scout ahead. Alp Arslan again moved around the mountain to get a battlefield more favourable to his cavalry-heavy army. The two forces finally encountered each other on the 25th of August. Sources claim that the Seljuk Sultan sent envoys to negotiate a peace, but Romanus was confident in his numbers and also thought that his secondary force would soon return and help surround the enemy. Yeah, they, so the yeah, they were running for their life. talk peace only in the Seljuk capital of Rey. Romanus sent a messenger to the second army with an order to attack the next day and ordered his forces to build camp fortifications. Seljuk horse archers harassed this camp throughout the night. On the next day, Romanus formed up his army to begin the battle. The 50,000 strong Byzantine force was divided into four groups. 
the Varangian Guard and Armenians were in the center under the Emperor's command. Turkic, Syrian and European mercenaries formed the flanks, while the Byzantine feudal levy, led by Andronikos Dokus, were in reserve, with orders to support the position that was put in the most danger. The Seljuk army had only around 30,000 troops. It created a crescent with its extreme flanks protruding forward, while its center, commanded by Alp Arslan, stayed back. Romanus continually moved forward, trying to get into a pitched battle, but the Seljuks were avoiding him and used the usual nomadic tactic of hit and run. The Seljuk center moved back while the flanks were trying to encircle the Byzantine wings. By the end of the afternoon, Romanus captured Albarslan's camp, but as dusk was getting closer, he ordered a retreat to his fortified camp. The Emperor's order created confusion, and in the dark, it seemed that his standard had fallen. The Seljuks used this distraction to attack the enemy's right flank with all of their forces. Andronikos Dukas was meant to help, but his family was feuding with the Emperor, so reserve forces never arrived, and the Byzantine right flank was utterly destroyed. By advancing so much against the Seljuks, the Byzantine flanks and center had lost their cohesion, so Romanus himself also failed to support against the attack. The Byzantine left was convinced that the Emperor was dead, and so retreated towards Manzikert, while all of Alp Arslan's forces attacked and surrounded the center. Although the Emperor's Varangian guard defended valiantly and killed many enemies, this group was also crushed by nightfall. An ordinary Seljuk soldier made the Emperor his hostage, and Alp Arslan's troops chased the remainder of the Byzantine army throughout the next day. You made some serious uh, military mistakes there, boy. Wow. Crazy. Sources claim that after the symbolic humiliation of Romanus, Alp Arslan treated the Emperor with kindness. They signed a peace treaty in which Antioch, Edessa, Hieropolis, and Manzikert were to be surrendered to the Seljuks, and the Emperor promised to pay 1.5 million gold pieces in reparations right away, and 360,000 gold pieces annually. Both sides agreed to a dynastic marriage between the Sultan's son and the Emperor's daughter. A few days after the battle, Alp Arslan released Romanus with gifts and an honor of you know, that's crazy, you know what I mean? That was arranged marriages and thing back then. In modern times, it would look like you just giving away your kids, you know what I mean? For a political reason. But for them, that was just part of it, you know what I mean? That's crazy that that was just like part of the culture if you're in a certain bracket in life. And I bet they did it even when they were in the poor neighborhoods too, you know what I mean? Uh, your daughter should marry my daughter because, you know, this, that, the other, you know, material gain and, you know, possibility of material gain. But that's just crazy. I guess it ain't no different than what the rappers call gold diggers now, but... It was organized, you know what I mean? And who would be the gold digger then, you know? <laughs> it's gonna be this country or that country. I'm gonna marry this dude, richer country, we're gonna get a piece of the pie. Wow, to use people like that, that's crazy. Uh, let's keep watching this here. Very escort. However, the Dukas family had already installed a new emperor, and in a short civil war in 1072, Romanus was defeated and blinded and soon after died from his wounds. Alp Arslan passed away shortly after, but his descendants managed to take control of most of Anatolia in the next two decades. The Seljuk conquests brought the Byzantine Empire to the brink of collapse, and sparked the Crusades from Western Europe. Okay. Okay, I'm real interested for the rest of this vibe coming up here and to get into the meat and the crusades and thing, you know what I mean? But uh, this is going to be interesting to say the least. I'll leave a link in the description. Kings and generals, man, I'm telling you, they got the good stuff. You know what I mean? Go over there and check them out. You'll learn a thing or two, you know what I mean? Or three or more. But uh, I hope you guys are having a good day today, man, you know? Take care of each other, alright? Cool runnings.